All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all without exception and to bless every single one of us without exception and our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep them steadfast and may he make them from among those who will achieve Jannah as well. Amen. My brothers and sisters, many times we have problems and difficulties. We face issues in our lives. It's only normal and natural. Nothing will happen exactly per our plan. Things happen as per the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some people deal with it in different ways. Some will tell you that, you know, I have a problem. I have an issue. This issue, I spoke to this person. I have a contact in this department. I spoke to that person. I did this with this one. I went to this doctor. I went to the top doctor in the world. I got a loan from a wealthy businessman and so on. I'm sure we hear this and we hear these things. At times people say, I went to the bank and mashallah, you know, I got a loan. I'm only paying 6%, but I got a loan. Not realizing that what they are doing is actually haram sometimes. However, even if it is something permissible, let us remember, never take supplication out of the equation. No matter what it is, always make dua, call out to Allah, keep on calling out to Allah. If it is a doctor and you have got the top doctor in the whole world, it is only by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that doctor will be able to diagnose the sickness and will be able to perhaps carry out the procedure if a procedure is required in a way that it is successful. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our hands is the trial. But in the hands of Allah is the success or failure of that particular trial. So it's important for us to note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to call out to him at all times. Call out to Allah. When Allah has made a need in your life, it's because he loves you. Because he wants you to cry to him. That's the reason. You haven't cried enough to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those tears that will result in your entry into Jannah. Those are the tears that you are meant to be allowing to flow down your cheeks subhanallah when it comes to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being called out to he loves it so much that sometimes he keeps us in a difficult situation so that we keep calling out to him a lot of us we have a disease what's the disease when we are in need we make dua we come for salah we become pious we become close to allah the minute the need is not there anymore everything flowing everything smooth we are wealthy and healthy and we've got everything flowing as per our wish for a little bit of time for a temporary period we tend to forget allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he strikes once again for us it seems negative but in actual fact it is not verse number 186 of surah al-baqarah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam something very interesting when my worshippers ask you about me, tell them that I am very near. That's what Allah is saying. When my worshippers ask you about me, tell them I am very near. I respond to the call of the one who supplicates me whenever he calls out to me. I respond. I know that he has called out and I know I have the solution for his problem. But I also know that that response is as per my wish, not per his wish. I know what is better for him. It is something amazing. My brothers and sisters keep calling out to Allah. Allah says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. I am close. I answer the call of the caller whenever he calls out to me, supplicates. It's important to keep making dua. But sometimes we make dua and we tend to feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not responded. It's the weakness of our Iman. My brothers and sisters, let's realize Allah says something very powerful. So let them respond to me. That's what Allah is saying. They call out to me, I will respond to them. But what about them? 
when I've called out to them, have they responded to me? That's the question. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to respond to all our du'as. We want goodness, we want health, we want a spouse, we want happiness, we want children, we want good children, we want wealth, we want so many other things. But when Allah says, get up for salah, we could not be bothered. When Allah says, dress appropriately, we could not be bothered. When Allah says, fast properly, we could not be bothered. Stop the pornography, we could not be bothered. Stop the gambling and the clubs, we are not bothered. Stop the drugs, we are not bothered. So Allah says, let them respond to me. It's something important. It is more important for us to answer Allah. Allah does not need us. We need Allah desperately. He doesn't need us at all. So let's remember, never be fooled by thinking that, oh, I am the one who's supposed to be calling out to Allah. Allah has asked you things. Allah has instructed you. So many instructions. Where are you with the call of Allah? If you were to respond to the call of Allah, Allah will respond to you instantly. You will understand the plan of Allah whenever you call out to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And this is why he says, bi. Let them believe in me. They need to believe. They need to understand. When I've instructed something, it is in order to save them from evil. It is in order to protect them from harm. It is not in order to make them suffer. When Allah says, get up early in the morning for salah, it's not so that you can suffer or so that you lose sleep, not at all. It is the best possible thing for you, but you don't know, subhanallah. If I had to prove it medically that Salatul Fajr is extremely healthy for you, everyone would be here for Salatul Fajr, subhanallah. But why is it when Allah says it, it's not sufficient? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. So this is a very powerful reminder for us to be saved from hellfire, to be saved from the difficulties, to get our du'as answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something very interesting regarding warfare. You and I know today on the globe, people are trying to spoil the image of Islam. People are doing acts that are gruesome and unacceptable in the name of Islam. People are perpetrating heinous crimes and claiming that the Quran teaches these crimes. Nay, not at all, never. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows every nation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the nation to have an army. It is only correct for a nation to have an army to defend it. That's correct, that is valid. But even that army that belongs to the nation is not allowed to just perpetrate crimes and do as they wish just because they claim to be the army of the land. Not at all. There are rules governing combat. There are rules governing what they should do. You and I, our name sometimes is spoiled, not because we've done something. Someone did something. They happen to be Muslim. We happen to be Muslim, although we don't agree with what they've done. Because we are Muslim, we are just painted with the same brush across the globe. In order to save ourselves from this, we need to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, if a thief comes to you, you're allowed to save yourself, defend yourself. If someone is attacking you, you're allowed to defend yourself. You must. If you die in the process, you die what we know as a shaheed, a martyr, because you've defended yourself, your honor, your dignity, your family, and so on, your wealth and whatnot. This is known as martyrdom. But at the same time, what we do need to realize, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 190 of Surah Al-Baqarah, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Fight in the cause of Allah. Those who fight you and don't go beyond the limits. If someone's not fighting you, you don't fight them. I cannot just pick up people and say, these people are not Muslim. They don't deserve to be alive. Let's fight them. That's not correct. All of us, somewhere up the ladder, were non-Muslim. Our forefathers somewhere, perhaps great, great grandfathers, someone taught them Islam. Someone was cared and bothered about them. That is how they accepted Islam. The same applies to many of us seated here who might have reverted to Islam or those who are listening to this. Surely, if we had to teach people to eradicate non-Muslims, we wouldn't even have been Muslims ourselves. We would have been eradicated a long time ago. So that is a wrong teaching, a wrong understanding. Allah says, fight those who fight you, meaning defend yourself. Those who are attacking you, you have every right to protect yourself. 
And Allah says, Wala ta'tadu. Do not go beyond the limits. So Muhammad sallallahu explains this in the narration in his words. He says, Wala ta'tadu. Don't go beyond the limits. Do not kill a woman. Do not kill a child. Do not harm an old man. Do not harm a person who doesn't want to fight. Don't harm the one who puts his weapons down. Don't want fight the one who has turned his back and is going away. Don't fight the one who's gone into his house and closes his doors. Don't fight those who are in the monastery or in the church and so on. Today, people blow up the masajid in the name of Islam. People blow up the churches in the name of Islam. Let's save ourselves, my brothers and sisters. Let's save ourselves from this type of calamity and disaster. It will result in chaos. And that's what has happened in some nations. Chaos. There is chaotic situation because people don't know why they are killing and people don't know why they are killed. The Prophet sallallahu says there will come a time la yadri al fi maqatal wal al fi maqutil. A person won't know why they are killing and the one who is killed won't know why was I killed. There is just chaos on earth. If you take a look at the way people are perpetrating crimes in the name of Islam, absolutely unacceptable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us defend the ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May he protect our lands and may he make us not from among those who fight each other and disunite. Today we are a force to be reckoned with billions of Muslims across the globe. All we need is a little bit of understanding, a little bit of unity, some love. We will always have differences of opinion. That doesn't mean we don't love one another. We can still love one another with differences of opinion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. Then we move on to saving ourselves from harming our own bodies. We spoke about the ummah a moment ago. Sometimes people think, you know, I'm a wealthy person. I can do whatever I want with this wealth. That's not true. Even if you are wealthy, you can only do what Allah wants you to do. Only do that which is beneficial for you, not harmful for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 195 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَأَنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَةِ Spend in the cause of Allah. Spend in the places that Allah has asked you to spend. And do not cause destruction to yourself with your own hands. You're causing harm. And from this, the scholars say, all these bad habits are prohibited. What are the bad habits? People who use their money to do that which is haram, to do that which is harmful to the body. Let me give you many examples. I know from amongst us, like I said on Friday, there are four or five people who smoke. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. When I say smoke here, I'm talking of ordinary cigarettes. Maybe four or five people who are hardcore smokers. I hope the number is decreased. I have gone to countries where it is banned to smoke. The whole country, not allowed. You've got special designated areas where you can go and smoke. And many people don't smoke. I've been to cities where smoking is banned, banned completely. And you're not allowed to smoke. You leave the city. I was in the city of Davao in the Philippines. And subhanallah, you're not allowed to smoke, not at all. They say when the head of state came to that city, the mayor made sure that he left the city to smoke and he had to come back later. Subhanallah, we are Muslimin. Come on, my brothers and sisters, I plead with you to quit smoking. I plead with you. It is harmful for your health. A packet is not allowed to be sold legally without the writing on it. Smoking kills. Wallahi, you can give it up. You will save a lot of money. You will save a lot of resources. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Okay, that is light compared to drugs. What about drugs? You cannot just use your wealth to buy drugs and to abuse substances, for example. You cannot do that. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, don't cause destruction to yourself with your own hands. And this applies even in situations when you are dealing with a situation, save yourself the harm, save your body the harm, save your nation the harm by doing what? By being wise. Do not try and solve a problem in a way that creates two or 10 problems. You solve it in a way that resolves the matter, decreases it, not increases it. Sometimes the methods we employ to solve a problem happen to create a disaster instead. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Then we have yet another beautiful teaching regarding prayer, dua, supplication. Some people when they make dua, like I mentioned yesterday, they only make dua for themselves. 
And I said yesterday, we should be making dua for others as well. Today, I want to speak about another aspect of it. Some people, when they make dua, they only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for goodness in this world. And they forget about the life after death. They forget about the grave, the punishment of hellfire and so on. So Allah makes mention of these people. Save yourselves from the fire of Jahannam by asking Allah to save you from it. Like we said, you're calling out to Allah. Ask Allah constantly, Oh Allah, save me from the fire, save me from the torment, grant me Jannah. Oh Allah, save me from Jahannam, protect me from Jahannam, from hellfire, and so on. So Allah says in verse number 200 of Surah Al Baqarah. From among the people are those who say, Oh Allah, give me in this world. They continue praying, give me in this world give me in this world but they have no portion in the hereafter nothing will remain for them in the hereafter they never ever asked Allah for goodness in the hereafter then verse number 201 of the same surah Allah says but from among the people they are those who know how to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from among the people are those who say, Oh Allah, safeguard us or grant us goodness in this world, grant us goodness in the hereafter and safeguard us from the punishment of hellfire. Allah says, those are the ones who will achieve. They are the ones who will achieve a portion of what they are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's learn to call out to Allah in the correct way. Then my brothers and sisters, when we are corrected, it's important for us to take the correction. MashaAllah. I remember when I started leading the Taraweeh, I met Sheikh Zaid and Sheikh Ismail who are leading with me the Taraweeh this year. And I told them, listen, if I make a mistake, you can yell the correction. I don't feel bad. You can say it as loud as you want. I don't feel bad. I remember making an announcement in this masjid that if you are hafid, please come forward. Do you remember me saying that the first night? Why? Because we want to be corrected. We don't feel bad. That's how we've improved ourselves over the years through correction. If you feel bad when you are corrected, you will never ever improve. Remember that. So don't be from among those who becomes arrogant when he is corrected and that makes him do the sin or that which is wrong even more and make leads him further into that particular wrong. That shouldn't be the case. We should be from among those whom when we are corrected, we are happy. We smile. We thank Allah. Oh Allah, someone has corrected me. It is reported that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu as powerful as he was, Amirul Mu'mineen. One day someone corrected him and the people were worried. Now this man is going to get it because you know, you're correcting the Amirul Mu'mineen. Wallahi, he made a dua. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I thank you that there are people who are still correcting the Amir. Subhanallah, who are we? we none of us are Umara on that level. We are, we are not leaders on that particular level. So Allah speaks about hypocrites and Allah speaks about those who become more arrogant when they are told fear Allah, change your ways, change your habits. My brothers and sisters, all of us need to be told. We all need correction. Even if a child is correcting you, take the correction. Thank Allah. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam's father lost out because he did not take the advice of his son. The son was young. He became arrogant. He said, no ways. Who are you to tell me? Allah says, verse number 206, Surah Al-Baqarah. When it is said to him, speaking of the hypocrite, the deviant, the one who is astray, fear Allah. What happens? Pride overtakes him in the sin. He continues further in that sin. Never let that happen. Allah says, that person, Jahannam is sufficient for them. They don't want correction. What was their whole purpose? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who can accept correction whenever we are corrected. Take heed, don't feel bad. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about hardships again. And he speaks about sabr again. Notice every day we're talking about sabr because it is one of the most important factors in the life of a mu'min, of a believer. Allah says, verse number 214, do you really think you are going to go into paradise? And we haven't yet tested you. 
you're going to get an O level certificate or a matric certificate depending on what exam you are writing without writing the exam. You need to come. We will test you. We are going to have difficult questions. Then we will give you your results. So Allah says, do you think you're going to get paradise? And that which came to those before you has not yet come to you. The tests we tested those before you have not yet come to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for them, hardship and poverty overtook them and they were shaken, including the messengers from among them. The messengers then said, when is the help of Allah going to come? And Allah says, Indeed, the help of Allah is very near. The help of Allah is very near. Do not despair. Don't lose hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest. My brothers and sisters, in the next 10 minutes, I would like to talk about the topic of marriage and talaq. Talaq meaning divorce. We need to save ourselves from marital discord by choosing the spouse for the right reasons. It doesn't mean the most handsome person is who you should run after or the most pretty of the girls is the one whom you feel will be the best wife. Not necessarily. You need to look for character, for conduct and for commitment to Allah. If there is commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is known as deen, the religion, the faith, the inclination to Allah. And if there is character and conduct, you will enjoy the person's company. This is what you need. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us and he speaks about divorce. He speaks about the rights of men and women. Many people, they come into the house and the man says, I'm the boss here. I'm the boss here. So you do exactly as I say, you're a woman, you're supposed to be under me and I can tell you anything. Now come, kiss my toes. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Honestly, there are people who do this. There are people who say this. But Allah says in verse number 228 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Indeed, for them, meaning for the women, are rights just like the men have rights. You need to fulfill each other's rights. Some of them are interlinked. Some of them are the same. Some of them, the man has more rights than women. And some of them, the woman has more rights than the man. This is Allah's plan. So Allah says, fulfill each other's rights. Respect each other. Help each other. Remember that is your spouse. Make life easy for them. Not difficult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then speaks about the scenario where the marriage is broken down. Totally broken down. In the, in the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us how divorce takes place. You only ever issue one talaq. If you really have to divorce your wife or a woman, you need to only issue one talaq. One. A lot of people think, oh, I just rattle out this word thrice and that's the way you divorce a person. That's wrong. That is actually a sinful way of doing things. You need to know that. It's wrong. You only ever issue one talaq. And thereafter, you are given approximately three months to reconcile if you wish. And if you haven't, then she can marry whom she wants. And as it is, your life continues. But if you have reconciled within three months, Alhamdulillah, you can take her back and you can live once again. And then you issue a second talaq if you do not get along thereafter. After the second one, you only have the last, meaning the third. When the third happens, you cannot get back to her. So people say, I've divorced my wife thrice. I can't get back to her. Why? Well, you tried once. You tried a second time. Now the third time, let someone else try. Subhanallah. <laughs> Perhaps they will get along with someone else. The third time meaning, once you divorced her, you issued one talaq. And then you lived again, you didn't get along. 
and everything broke down beyond repair. Another talaq went through. It broke down again beyond repair. Now a third time, if she marries someone else, perhaps there will be better qualities in that person. And if without your planning or interference, she happens to be divorced from the second person, it only makes sense that she will now appreciate you. The reason is she will realize this man had 20 weaknesses, but the guy I went to after him had 200 weaknesses. Subhanallah, this man used to smoke 10 cigarettes. That guy used to smoke 10 packets of cigarettes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So then when she comes back, she will appreciate it. So this is one of the very important points that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises. However, when the period of idda is being passed or is passing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't take back a woman in order to punish her. Some people say, you know what? I'm going to punish this woman. I'm not going to divorce her. I'm just going to keep her and let her hang. Let her do what she wants. Astaghfirullah. Did you know that she can actually get what is known as a fasq? Fasq meaning she can get a nullification of that marriage. She can. She can actually do it without you. Do you know that? If she has legitimate reason. A lot of the women don't know this because we've kept them in the dark. We don't want them to know this. But they can actually get a nullification of that nikah. Allah says, keep them in goodness, on good terms, or release them on good terms, but don't hold them back in order to punish them. That is mentioned, verse number three, 231 of Surah Al Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُمْسِكُونَ Do not hold them back in order to harm them, in order to punish them. Release them, let them go, let them go happily with a smile. Perhaps they will regret. Perhaps they will say, no, this man was really a good man. Look, he released me and I'm gone home. Subhanallah, he didn't harm me. He didn't hurt me and he didn't hold me back to punish me. So Alhamdulillah, it was something good. However, let's remember my brothers and sisters, we save ourselves from the punishment of Allah. When you hold back a woman knowing that you don't want her, but you don't want to release her, Allah will punish you at some stage in this world and the next. May Allah not do that to us. May we not do that to anyone. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something interesting to the fathers of the girls. We all have dreams. We all have children. MashaAllah. May Allah bless those who don't have children with children. But those of us who do, when they grow older, we all have a dream. We want to get them married here. We want to get them married there and so on. But we don't realize sometimes they want to marry someone we didn't even expect. So if they want to marry that person for as long as their deen is in order and their character is in order, let them get married because this child is not yours. It's actually Allah's child. It's actually Allah's worshiper. You are only a custodian for a period of time. Allah can take the child away at any time. You need to fulfill that examination question. The answer needs to be correct. What is the question? Will you let this amana of mine, Allah is saying, marry according to what I have dictated, or do you want to add your own flavor and pepper, whether it's racial, you know, a racial issue or any other issue, tribal issue, sometimes it's an issue of nationalities and so many other things. All that we have made up. It's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about this. But what is more difficult is when your child is married and then she's divorced from that man and she wants to go back to him. But you as a father or mother saying, no way, don't go back. No way. I'm not happy. I will disown you. I'm never going to talk to you again. And the child is saying, but dad, I've got two children with this particular man. And you know what? I think it's okay. I will manage. I will cope. No way. We don't want over my dead body. So now they're making dua, oh Allah, let this man die over his dead body. Oh Allah, he said over his dead body. We don't want that to happen. My brothers and sisters, listen to what Allah says. Allah says, فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَن يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ إِذَا تَرَاضَوْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Verse number 232 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, when the idda is over, they are divorced. Do not stop them from getting married again to their spouses who, whom they were divorced from. If they have agreed, both of them are happy. They want to get back together. You don't block them. Imagine this is a verse of the Quran. 
and some of us go against it openly, clearly, blatantly. Never. Don't ever go back. And Allah is saying, let them go back. They know. If they want to, let them go. I want to say one last point before I close. Let your child make a mistake rather than them becoming mad and depressed. Rather than your home breaking. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Inshallah, we will continue tomorrow. Until then, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.